Romans, chapter 8, verse 26 through 30. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of spirit because the spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. The word of the Lord. The Lord be with you. This morning, I'm going to invite you to join me in imagining. It's a faculty we don't use enough. Picture this. The time is 40 days after the first Easter Sunday, some 2,000 years ago. The place is just on the outskirts of Jerusalem. Jesus is preparing to leave again, this time to go back to heaven. His disciples press around him. Of course, they have many questions, but he declines to answer. And instead, he says, I am sending upon you the gift my father promised. So stay here in the city until you receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. And after he said that, Jesus was taken up from them before their very eyes And a cloud hid him from their sight. The disciples are just standing there, staring up into the sky. And suddenly two men clothed in white appear beside them and say, Men of Galilee, why are you looking into the sky? This same Jesus, whom you have seen taken from you to heaven, will return in the same way you have seen him go. So the disciples walk back to Jerusalem. Now what? What were the disciples to do after Jesus ascended? And why am I talking about this today? Well, two reasons. (laughs) First of all, this week on Thursday, the coming Thursday, May the 26th, is Ascension Day. Christians around the world who follow the liturgical calendar will commemorate the very occasion I've just been describing, Jesus' ascension into heaven after the crucifixion, after the resurrection, 50 days after the resurrection, or 40 days, rather. The second reason I'm telling you about this story and inviting you into it is because I think that in some ways, sometimes, we now feel a little like those first century disciples did as they saw Jesus go. I think sometimes we feel bereft and floating, anchorless at sea. We don't feel that way because we just saw Jesus leave us, of course. I'm not sure what all the factors are, but I, I do sense that in the world we live in, there's a general sense of moorings having been loosened as if something that held us secure is gone or 
at least is leaving. Why is that? Now, obviously, for some people, it's because their lives were never tied to moorings that were very stable to begin with. I mean, if people spend their whole lives accruing money and getting stuff and having fun of every sort imaginable or pushing other people out of the way to achieve and attain and get power and recognition, well, you know, those are transient. Those things are here today and gone tomorrow. We know that. And Christians especially should know the parable of the house unwisely built on sand. you remember that? Because we Christians have hoped in Christ for our eternal security. He has established us firmly in his kingdom and he has given us meaningful work to do in the meantime. So why do I think that we might be like those first disciples in our insecurity? Well, remember, those first century disciples, the ones that saw Jesus ascend, this is almost inconceivable to me, but they had walked and talked with Jesus for years. I mean, they'd eaten with him. They'd camped out with him. They'd been with him in crowds and on the mountain and by the sea and in the boats. They had, they'd been there. They were the people. But now Jesus was gone. The one whom they had come to believe had died for them. The one who had risen from the grave and come back amazingly to give them eternal life was gone. How were they going to keep connected to him? How were they going to stay connected to God the Father? Jesus wasn't there to do it for them. Could anything ever make up for that loss of intimacy? The answer is yes. Because remember, before his crucifixion, Jesus had prepared his disciples. He had said to them, okay, I'm going away. And they always got upset when he said that. But he said it several times. On this occasion, though, he says, I'm going away. In a little while, you won't see me anymore. See, I can't even think, what were they thinking? Well, who knows? But Jesus said it. And he said, I'm going away. In a little while, you won't see me. But I'm going to ask God the Father to send you another advocate. Now, the word that Jesus uses there in Greek, I won't go into it, but it could also mean counselor or comforter. It basically means one who comes alongside. Some of you have heard this before. But he says, I'm going to ask the Father and he'll send you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. And then he said, you know him for he lives with you. And this is really weird and this is exactly what the Greek words say no matter what transcript you look at he he has been living with you he will be in you there's a distinction between those two prepositions in the greek a clear distinction no doubt about it he has been with you he lives with you or some some, some manuscripts say he has been with living with you he has been living with you he will be in you so what did the disciples do then after jesus ascends they walk back to jerusalem and scripture says they went upstairs to the room where they were staying and got snacks. No, they didn't get snacks. We don't know whether they got snacks or not. Importantly, I, I just think what scripture doesn't say sometimes is hilarious. But it, what it does say is they went upstairs and they all joined together constantly in prayer. I mean, probably they did get something to eat. Probably they took a nap. But they joined together in prayer for 10 days. We know they did it because I'll tell you later what happens at the end. They were praying with each other and with all the women who were with them. I think that's amazing. They included the women who had been serving them and, and taking care of them. And with Mary, the mother of Jesus, there she is again. And with Jesus' brothers. I love that. I believe they were groaning in prayer. I don't think they were just praying for, oh, well, you know, please help us get out from under Roman rule. No, I don't think they were praying. I think they were groaning in their spirits for what Jesus had promised, but what they could not possibly imagine. Does that sound familiar? Last Sunday, Eric preached from the Word of God as written by the Apostle Paul in a letter to the first century Christians in Rome. It's amazing to me how accurately the Word of God describes their situation 2,000 plus years ago 
and our situation today. Listen to the scripture. For creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. Eric did a stupendous job of explaining what that means last Sunday. Watch it online if you weren't here. And not only creation, but we ourselves groan inwardly while we wait. For in this hope we were saved. What does salvation even mean, we say to ourselves? We are groaning too, maybe not audibly, but in our spirits. We cannot yet see our full salvation. We, like those first century disciples who saw Jesus go, we are living in an in-between time already, but not yet. We have already received forgiveness for our sins because of Jesus' death on the cross. But we have not yet been saved from the outpouring of God's wrath on the day of judgment at the end of time. That's, that's yet to come. We have already received the gift of eternal life, but the last vestiges of rebellion have not been eradicated from our natures yet. All of that is in the future. All of that and so much more is in our future. God's word says that it was in that hope that we were saved. But like those first disciples, if we hope for what we do not see, we have to wait for it with patient eagerness. Eric talked about this a couple Sundays ago. The words in Greek mean standing on tiptoe. Like my granddaughter when I'm getting a snack out of the cupboard. What's up there? She's looking. She says, what is that snack? Well, I'll let you know. That's what Jesus basically says. You wait, you watch, I'll let you know. Sometimes, I have to tell you, and I'm, this is a confessional moment here. I'm serious about this. Sometimes, the truth of the concept of salvation and the eventual consummation of all things, the eventual renewal of this world and the unification of it with heaven, sometimes that seems so abstract. I mean, I believe it, and I'm trying to live it, but Jesus' feet have disappeared into the cloud, and here we are walking around between earth and sky. In my observation, most of us struggle with that patient eagerness. We're grateful for all that God gives us, and we, we say that and we mean it. We're grateful for the gift of salvation, the gifts that we have in our lives, the gift of grace. But we're tired of waiting. It's been 2,000 years. We want full salvation and redemption that Christ promised us. We cry out for an immediate, intimate link with God. Don't you just wish you could ask Jesus, like, when's it going to happen? Like, what's, go what's it going to be? Don't you wish he was just, like, here? In yes, of course we do. But as Paul describes it, we groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. So if we stopped right there, we would have to say, Pretty difficult, pretty despairing. But, but I want you to notice, do you see the ellipsis there, dot, dot, dot? Something has been left out. Let's look at the whole verse. We who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship and redemption of our bodies. We who have the first fruits of the Spirit. What does that mean? It means that we are weak and waiting just like those first century disciples. But the gift that they were waiting for in that upper room in Jerusalem, we have already received. We have already received. The death and resurrection of Jesus Christ made possible forgiveness for sins for everyone who would receive it. The other gift, the gracious gift, the other advocate that Jesus promised the Father would send was sent only after Jesus' ascension. We don't pay enough attention to that. After Jesus' ascension, he says, I'm going to have to go. It's good for you that I'm going. They said, oh, don't go, don't go. And Jesus said, no, you need for me to go because it will be only after I go that the other will come. The Bible is full of the work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was there at creation. Look at Genesis 1-1. The Holy Spirit is hovering over the waters. He participated in the creation. When Mary says to the angel Gabriel, well, how am I going to have a baby? I'm a virgin. The angel replies, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of God will overshadow you so that the one to be born will be called the Son of God. Throughout the Bible, the Holy Spirit 
is the advocate and comfort of the faithful. He spoke through the prophets. He empowered David and all the Old Testament greats to do mighty things. He was the one who parted the waters to let the Israelites come across the Red Sea. It was the Holy Spirit who did those things. But he never lived in individual spirits until Jesus goes back to heaven. Read your Bible. It's there. Ten days after they walk back to Jerusalem, after the ascension, they pray for ten days. And in the divine drama of the day of Pentecost, the Father and the Son send the Spirit. The gift of God for the people of God. And let me make a sidestep here. This is footnote, brackets. The Holy Spirit is He, a person, the third person of the triune God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. In the Bible, the Holy Spirit is always referred to in the singular third person masculine pronouns. He, not it. Now, I'm not making a case here for a gender-specific God. Don't get off on that. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm just trying to make clear to you that the Holy Spirit is a person. Think about how differently that means you relate to the Holy Spirit. Not a robot, not a disembodied something, but a person. Invisible, but a person. And think how differently that means he relates to you. We are frustrated. We've been promised salvation, but we don't get it yet. We are frustrated because we are still mortal. And for now, we can't get away from the, all that that means. We groan because our rebellious spirits hinder us from living the way God would be pleased with. Remember what Paul wrote in the seventh chapter of Romans? Why do I keep doing the things I don't want to do? He says so very eloquently. Well, see, the Holy Spirit is our advocate, our counselor, our comforter, our helper in all of that. He intimately inhabits all aspects of our lives with Jesus. He troubles us when we sin. You know, when we do something wrong and you feel bad about it, that's the Holy Spirit. When, you're, when you think, oh, I, I want to do something good here today, that's the Holy Spirit prompting you. When you are empowered to overcome some temptation, that's the Holy Spirit. The Apostle Paul writes in the 12th chapter of Romans, Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's the Holy Spirit. He renews your mind and transforms your life by subduing your sinful nature and empowering you to live God's law of love. That's the Holy Spirit. People say, well, that's the Spirit of Jesus. It's the same thing. The Bible uses those two phrases synonymously. Of course it's the Spirit of Jesus. It's all one God. Not three gods, one God. I don't understand it either. I'm just telling you. <laughs> we just have to accept that. If, if we just had that, that would be enough to send us out praising. But I want to say one more thing. Take a look at today's scripture one more time. This was actually what Joel read. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. Why are we talking about prayer all of a sudden? Paul hasn't been writing that much about prayer. Why do you suppose that the Word of God focuses in here among the many ministries of the Holy Spirit on prayer? Well, before Jesus went back to heaven, when he was describing this gift that God was going to send, he says this about what the Holy Spirit's going to do. He says, he will teach you all things and remind you of everything I've said to you. He will testify about me. He will guide you into all truth. He will speak what he hears. He will glorify me by giving you what he has received from me, making it known to you. Jesus' main descriptor of the work of the Holy Spirit is as a communicator. That's what the Holy Spirit mainly does, although he does, of course, infinitely other things. In our human weakness, you and I don't know how to pray, and we don't know what to pray for. Even when you're inclined to pray, you think, well, I don't even know what to pray for. Do I pray that the Ukrainian people survive what's going on? Do I pray that Vladimir Putin, you know, gets taken out in some way? Do I, do I pray that, you know, they overcome? What do I pray? Do I pray that, that you know, this person I've been praying for gets better? Or since they're so close to death, do I just pray that God lets them die and takes them to heaven? I mean, who knows what to pray for? You don't even know. But that's why we don't have to worry the Holy Spirit is praying with us. The Holy Spirit with us and in us is the divine communicator. 
He is the living link between our mortal lives and the immortal, invisible, ineffable God. Beside our wordy wonderings and our silent uncertainties, the Holy Spirit prays. And the Bible says he groans in prayer. He's not groaning because he's ignorant like we are. He's groaning because he's empathetic. He hears our hearts and he communicates those prayers. He doesn't just translate them or convey them. He groans them in a, a divine prayer language. He bears with us the burdens that we have in our patient eagerness and he wordlessly groans it to the Godhead. Now keep in mind, that this is important, footnote this, the Holy Spirit's intercession is not a substitute for you and me praying. Just because the Holy Spirit's praying for us doesn't mean we ought to quit. Rather, think of it this way, the Holy Spirit's intercession is our assurance that our prayers are heard. And that they will be answered. Because the scripture says this, God the Father who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit. Because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. And God always hears and always answers the prayers of the Holy Spirit. Don't you find that sometimes life is just beyond words? Sometimes pain is too deep to be said Sometimes disappointment and despair melt into fear that things will always be this way. Sometimes you're so angry with yourself and disappointed that try and try and try again, you cannot get it right. You can't stop doing it. You can't stay away from it. You've cried every tear, but you can't settle it. You just want God to know how desperately you want for things to be different. That's why the Holy Spirit groans. The Holy Spirit is the intimate God we long for. He groans wordlessly, meaningfully, like the murmurings of a loving mother over a weeping child. like the deep, deep sighs when a love dies. This is the child I love. This is the one whose heartbreak breaks mine. This is the one whose pain I share. And the Holy Spirit's prayers divinely modulate and divinely transpose our prayers along with the wordless groanings of creation until all our groanings come together, come into harmony with the crystal, shimmering, rolling tone of the music of prayers within God himself. What would it mean to you to know that God is living in you? Now, like right now. Expressing within himself all that you long for and all that is good in God's sight for you. All of your love, all of your awe, your fear, your loneliness, your gratitude, your questions, your love. That's what it does mean. Because the Holy Spirit of God lives not only with but also within everyone who belongs to Christ. Would you pray with me, please? Lord God of heaven and earth, we pray because of the sacrifice of Christ. We pray because of the grace of your spirit. We pray in words that so very partially express our prayers. Hear us, we pray. We know you do. Receive our prayers. Receive them as they are transposed by the work of the Holy Spirit. That we may know your love in our lives and we may express our gratitude. In Jesus' name and through his spirit we pray. Amen.